Okay, so in this video, I'm going to tell you about the Euler-Lagrange equation, and I suppose about Lagrangian mechanics in general. I haven't said what either of those things are yet, but it's not too bad. So in my last video, I talked about the principle of least action, um, but only for one particle in one dimension, right? It only was moving in one dimension. Um, now I'm going to talk about an arbitrary number of particles, for example, moving, I guess you could say, in any number of dimensions. So now, talking about Lagrangian mechanics in total generality. Um, so, you know, in real life, you know, you could have, you know, three particles or however many particles you want, right? Let's call these particles one, two, and three. And each particle can have some position coordinates, right? So maybe particle one has coordinates x1, y1, and z1. Particle two has coordinates x2, y2, and z2. And particle three, as you might have guessed, has the coordinates x3, y3, and z3. So here, we really want to keep track of nine numbers, right? Because we have three coordinates for all three particles. Um, so we're going to have a new way of writing this. We're going to refer to all of the variables as q sub i. So physicists like to use q a lot of the time to be a coordinate. So i will be a little number a little integer that could be any number from 1 to n, where n could once again be any number. So, for example, in this case I just drew, n would be 9, because there are 9 coordinates we want to keep track of. So we could say this x1 is q1, y1 is q2, z1 is q3, and we could label all of the 9 coordinates we want to keep track of with q sub 1 through 9. Pretty easy. Now, another thing I should say is that when I say coordinate, I don't necessarily mean a spatial coordinate. So, for example, if you have a pendulum, right, and the pendulum has some length l, and there's some, you know, maybe there's some gravitational acceleration g, well, that's not too important. Um, obviously, this pendulum, the weight at the end of the you know, rod or the rope or whatever, has some coordinate, right? Maybe x, y, z. And you could track how this you know, coordinate changes as the pendulum moves back and forth. But you could also just specify the position of the pendulum just using an angle, theta. Right? And theta will change in time, just as x, y, and z do. And if you want to, you could simplify this problem a lot just by looking at theta and seeing how theta changes. So in this case, we might only want to describe our pendulum using one coordinate, theta. And we could, for example, call theta q sub 1, just as uh, we were calling our other things, you know, q sub 1 through 9 or whatever. Now we could just call theta our q. So when I say coordinate, I don't necessarily mean a spatial coordinate. I mean a very general thing. All right, now having said that, um, let's talk about the Lagrangian. So in general, the Lagrangian is going to depend on all n of our position coordinates, and it's also going to depend on all n velocities of our position coordinates, which I'm specifying with a dot, so q1 dot through qn dot. And you could also consider, you know, well, wait a second, why does it depend on q1 double dot 
but we never really like think about that just because we don't really see these things in real life. So we're only going to so we're being as general as we want to be. So we're saying, okay, our Lagrangian depends on every single velocity and every single position, but not accelerations and stuff like that. Another thing I just want to say as a bit of notation is that, you know, it's going to get kind of cumbersome to write out this whole thing every time. So I'm just going to write it out like this. So L of QI and QI dot, where the idea is that really we're plugging in every i from 1 to n. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, just as before, I'm going to define my action s to depend on my path q sub i of t, where once again, I'm really thinking about all the i's running from 1 to n, but I'm not going to write all those out, where this action s is the integral between 2 times t1 and t2 of L, my Lagrangian, of q sub i of t and q sub i dot of t. So now that I've finished defining everything, now I want to say what it is that I actually want to do. So what I want to do is to say, okay, whoops, I shouldn't even, I want to say, okay, say, you know, my three particles, for example, it could be anything, but say my three particles start at these three positions at a given time, t1, right? So at t1, particle 1 is here, particle 2 is here, and particle 3 is here. And then at some later time, T3, let's say my particle has somehow, my particle 1 has somehow ended up here, particle 2 has somehow ended up all the way out here, and particle 3 has ended up here. What, and if I know, if I know what my Lagrangian is, right, every possible path that, uh, let me see, every possible path that a particle could take to get from these positions to these, fin these initial positions to these final positions has some action S associated with it. Now I'm not saying there's an action S associated with each of these paths, I'm saying the action S is associated with all three of these paths, and it depends also, like, how fast the particle is going along the path and stuff like that. So S depends on whichever path they happen to take. The question we want to ask is, what paths minimize S, right? And maybe the correct path, I don't know, what do you think the correct path might look like? Maybe for some sort of crazy forces, it might look, you know, you know, three might get swinged around, swung around and stuff like that. There might be some correct path that minimizes S. Or, you know, as I talked about, it could also maximize S. Or, really what I'm trying to say is, what paths are stationary? for our action S. So let me, let me clear up my uh, drawing a bit. So what do I mean by stationary? Well, if you recall, um, stationary means that, actually let me use my familiar color green. Stationary means that for all nearby paths, paths that are almost exactly the same as, you know, let's say this green path here, um, they have almost the exact same action S. And what do I mean by almost the exact same action? Well, I mean that if we write our action S as like S plus some little change, whoops, 
plus some little change, delta s, where this is our term to the first order in the variation delta s equals zero. And if you're not totally clear on what I'm saying right now, I talked a lot about this in my last video. But basically, we can write all the nearby paths in terms of some little number um, times, you know, a little, um, you know, variation of the path. And in terms of that little number, if we keep it to the first order, we want this thing right here to be zero. And that will mean that our path is stationary. And in order to minimize s, we want our path to be stationary. Or in order to maximize s2, we'd also want it to be stationary. So that's all we're trying to do. We're, in other words, we're trying, we're trying to do the same thing <laughs> that we did in the last video. The only difference is now I'm going to do it in more generality. All right? So what is the plan of attack? What are we going to do? What is the plan? OK, the plan is to expand. You know, this is just following what we did in the last video. Is to expand the action in terms of the tiny variation in our path, and we're going to throw out uh, higher order terms. We're only going to keep it to the first order in our variation, right? That's the first thing you're going to do. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to use this to find delta s and then set delta s equal to 0 in order to find our stationary path, right? Our stationary path is, or a stationary path is one with delta s equal to 0. So we want to, so you know, we have to set delta s equal to 0 in order to find our stationary path. And then as our third step, we have to rearrange how we wrote out our delta s in order to find out the condition to have a stationary path. So it's the exact, it's, it, I really mean it, it is the exact same three things that we did earlier. The only difference is now I want to do it in more generality. And when we do it, what we're going to do is we're going to arrive at the Euler-Lagrange equation. We will have successfully found it. All right, so are you ready to do it? Okay, now we're just going to do out all the little mathematical steps to find the Euler-Lagrange equation. All right, are you excited? <laughs> okay. Okay, so just like last time, let's start off by saying that we know what the true path that uh, minimizes the action is, or I guess, you know, makes the action stationary is what I should really say, and that this path is q bar sub i, where the bar is just notation, right? It doesn't, it's not like the complex conjugate or something. Um, now, every path, as we noted last time, can be expressed as the true path plus some other path, eta, where eta at t1 equals 0 and eta at t2 equals 0. Now here I wrote eta sub i. Now why is that? Well, remember we need to really have i go from 1 to n. So in this case, because now I have n different um, q sub i's, I also need to have n different eta sub i's. So this time, I don't just have a variation in one coordinate. 
Like last time there was only one function, eta of t. Now I have n different eta of t's, which I'm labeling n sub i. And I mean, sorry, eta sub i. And each of these functions, they all have to be 0 at t1 and t2. So the next thing we did is that we observed that every path could also be written as q sub i of t plus a constant epsilon times eta of t. And here, we're going to once again do the same thing. Now notice that I, don't, I didn't write epsilon sub i. No, no, no. I just have one epsilon. So all the paths, so all of the coordinates share the same epsilon, right? Now, something that uh, I'm going to do in this video that was a little bit different from the last video is that instead of writing the epsilon and the eta separately like this, this time in this video, I'm going to do something that's a bit more common for physicists to do. And I'm going to write this as q sub i of t plus epsilon sub i of t. And the thing is that, well, for one, it saves us a bit of stuff to write. And the other thing is that we can just think of this as our, as our variation of the path. So we still have epsilon sub i of t1 is 0, and epsilon sub i of t2 is 0 for all i's from 1 to n. Um, and we're going to expand, and we're going to, when it's time to expand out our action, which we're going to do in a second, just as we thought of this as being small, as this constant epsilon of being, as being small, now we're going to think of this whole thing as being small. Because really, I mean, what did we just do? We just said that epsilon times eta sub i of t equals epsilon sub i of t, where this epsilon and this epsilon are actually different because this one right here is a constant, and this one right here are actually n different um, functions of t. Okay, so I'm just going to switch up notation a bit in order to be more similar to the rest of physics literature. Okay, so now, ooh, I have to choose a color. I'm going to choose a, a calming blue. So now, let's write our action of this varied path. I'm going to try and stick to the colors because I think it um, might make it easier to visualize, you know. So our action, S, of Q bar sub i of t plus epsilon sub i of t. This equals, I'm just going to write what we already know, just to remind you, S of Q sub i of Q bar sub i of t um, plus delta S, which is our term to the first order in epsilon, um, plus higher order terms in epsilon. So I guess here I mean the constant epsilon, but it's all the same thing. So in order for this q bar sub i to be the true path, we need, as you remember, for delta s to equal 0. And I really gave a thorough explanation in the last video, but it's the same thing in this video. OK, so let's actually go about expanding our action. So 
Um, yeah. So we know what S is. It's the integral from T1 to T2 of L of Q bar sub I of T plus epsilon sub I of T um, and also of Q I bar dot, so now this is the time derivative, plus epsilon sub I of T dot. All right, so this is just plugging in um, this path into what our action is here and here. All right, now the next step is a little confusing, and it confused me for some period of time. So I'm gonna, how I'm gonna do this is I'm first I'm gonna write it out, and then I'm going to justify it. So the above line is equal to the integral from T1 to T2 of the Lagrangian of q sub i bar and q sub i bar dot, all right, and I check this out, plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of epsilon sub i of t partial L over partial Q sub I plus epsilon sub I dot of T partial L over partial Q sub I dot and then that's the end of the sum. And then all of this, oops, all of this multiplied by dt, and then plus the epsilon squared in higher terms. So, okay, what is this? What do we have here? Well, what I did is I Taylor expanded L in terms of these two, or not two, in terms of these small um, additions to Q sub I bar and Q sub I bar dot. So why is this? Well, all it is is it's a Taylor expansion, but in multiple variables. So in just one variable, right, if we have f of x plus delta x, where delta x is supposed to be small, to the first order in delta x, this is about equal to f of x plus delta, oop, delta x times f prime of x. Likewise, we can do the same thing if, x, if f is a function of two variables x and y. So say f is a function of two variables x and y, I want to find f of x plus delta x and y plus delta y. Well, first we can just think of it as a function of x and just adding little delta x on. So just copying the line above, this is about equal to f of x comma y plus delta y plus delta x and then we're really thinking of this as just a function in x for the moment. So it's just partial f over partial x, and then evaluate it at x comma y plus delta y. Okay, then the next thing is that we can think of all of this as a function of y. So here we see y plus delta y here and y plus delta y here. 
So first, let's expand out this right here. So this is about equal to f of x comma y plus delta y, whoops, delta y, partial f over partial y of x comma y. And then we got to deal with this term right here. So we write plus delta x times delta f over delta x evaluated at x comma y, right? Plus delta x delta y partial, um, I guess, well, partial, uh, well, the partial squared of f over partial, well, partial y and partial x evaluated at x comma y. So I guess actually I should really write this uh, like this. Oops. And then bring this down here, and then um, <laughs> sorry. I guess that's. I think. I guess I'm being a little bit silly, but uh, you know, whatever. Okay. So now notice that if delta x and delta y are both small, um, then this term right here we can can't we can just cross out because it's smaller than we care about. So really, what we did here is we expanded. Well, we expanded um, this right here in terms of just f of x and y, and then we just Taylor expanded x and y individually. Now this is really what happened here. This is really what happened with this term. So we had to expand out two n variables because this counts for n variables, and this counts for n variables, even though we didn't write them out completely. It still counts. Um, so we have to sum over all two n variables. We're here summing from one to from one to n, and here we have one of the variables, and here we have the other one of the variables. Because epsilon sub i and epsilon sub i dot are both small because they're both you know tiny little variations. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, just if you really care about analysis, right, and you're wondering like oh, wait, why is like this necessarily small just because this is small? Like, You don't necessarily know that the time derivative is small just because the function is small. Well, I'll just remind you that, um, that we really defined epsilon sub i of t equal to epsilon times eta sub i of t, um, where this was a constant, this was a small constant, and this was a function of t. And then to dot this, we just dot this. But this is still just a small constant, so it, it all remains there. So analysts conquered. Okay, so yeah, so I just Taylor expanded this whole thing in two n variables, and we le left over all the epsilon squared and higher terms. Okay, so that's, conf that's uh, one of the big confusions about this step. Um, hope it's been explained. The next, uh, another thing I want to say is what's really going on with this and also with this, right? What is partial L partial Q sub I? Well, let me, ooh, let me use a different color. Let me give you an example. So, in the one particle case in one dimension, we had L was a function of two variables, x and x dot, and it was equal to one-half m x dot squared minus v of x. Now, partial L over partial x, you might guess, is just, well, that's just negative v prime of x if you think that this is an independent variable. You just, you just, I'm, I'm just saying this is what you might think, and you actually be right. Okay, partial L over partial X 
is just negative v prime of x, where v prime, but v prime is the derivative of v with respect to x, right? And then partial l over partial x dot would be equal to, well, you might look at x dot and say, well, that maybe is its own independent variable. Um, and in this case, you'd be right. And you would say, well, the derivative of x squared is just 2x, so the derivative of x dot squared is, oh, sorry, and so the derivative of, right, x dot squared is 2x dot. All right, so this is the correct way of doing things, and you might sort of be wondering, well, wait a second, x dot and x, right, these are like very much tied together. They are not independent variables. So how are we really doing this? Well, the thing is that our Lagrangian, right, in this case, is only taking in two numbers. We could call them anything. We could call them a and b. And we could just write um, that our Lagrangian is now 1 half mb squared minus v of a. And then I'm sure you'd have no problem saying, oh yeah, partial l over partial a is equal to negative v prime of a. And partial l over partial b is equal to and b. So what I so really we could plug anything into L, right? We could plug anything into L. It just so happens that here we're plugging in x and x dot, and that's just our choice to plug in x and x dot um, at some specific time. So that's what this term and this term are really about. And maybe it's sort of bad notation. Maybe we should be writing stuff like partial L over partial A or stuff like that. But this is how everybody does it. Um, and, you know, you got to know it just because that's the way everyone always does it. All right. Now, the last thing uh, I want to say about this is that in every other turn, in every other step, right, I had some green. I had some Q bar appear in, like, this equation and this equation. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a Q bar in this term. I mean, there's one here, but there's not one here. And it seems like it should be here. And the reason is that if you really want to be like totally clear, we should really be saying that these two things, partial L, partial Q sub I, and partial L, partial Q sub I dot, should really be evaluated at Q bar. Because, you know, sorry, wait. Because... If you have f of x plus delta x, right, that's about equal to f um, of x plus delta x, f prime of x. If we don't write these evaluation bars, right, here and here, if we don't write them, it's sort of like writing this as, um, whoops, it's sort of like writing this as, f of x plus delta x f prime, and not saying where I'm evaluating it at, right? Not saying I'm evaluating it at x. That's sort of like what we're doing here if we don't write these bars. And most of the time people don't write these like bars here because it's assumed that you know that you're evaluating it at, at um at q bar. But um I think it's just good to say that explicitly. So now I want to, and I'm actually not going to write the bars just because that's not how people like really write it in physics books and I want to be, uh, I want you to be able to look at those. Whoops. So, you know, if you want to. So just to get you ready for the real world, I'm not going to write the bars. Okay. So, Oof, so hopefully I've explained this whole line. Okay. Now, notice that, well, I guess I'll write it one more time, just a little bit differently. This is equal to the integral of, um, from the integral, from t1 to t2 of L, of q sub i bar and q sub i bar dot, and then I'm going to take 
this sum here, I'm going to take it outside of the integral, um, plus, whoops, plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of the integral from t1 to t2 of, well, I, so open up my parentheses, ah, yeah, epsilon sub i of t partial l over partial q sub i plus epsilon sub i dot of t, t partial l over partial q sub i dot don't forget the dt and then once one last time plus o of epsilon squared okay so notice that this thing right here, I'm even just going to copy and paste. This thing right here is just the action of q bar um, sub i of t, this, the, the stationary path. Whereas this thing, or actually I'll do it even orange, this whole thing right here is equal to I guess I could have just written it, but it was kind of fun to copy it. <laughs> Delta S. So this is the thing that is zero, that has to be zero for stationary paths. Oof. All right. You got it. Now, the next and really last difficult thing that we have to do is to rearrange Delta S. And we're going to do the same um, integration by parts thing that we did in my, in my other video. Um, it's really like the only thing to do. Okay, just clearing all of this up here because it's fun to clear everything up. Um, oops. Ah, whoa, what's happening? Oh, okay, I see. Um, ooh, I guess I should choose orange. Okay, so we want to have zero equal to delta s equal to all of this. Now I can finally get rid of this. <sighs> okay. Now I'm going to, um, I'm going to integrate this term right here. I'm going to integrate this term right here by parts. Um, This term, I'm just going to rewrite again. I'm not going to change it at all. So the integral from t1 to t2 of epsilon sub i of t partial L partial q sub i dt. And now I'm going to integrate this thing by parts. So the very first term is just epsilon sub i of t partial l over partial q sub i dot evaluated at t1 and t2. And then the other term that comes from integration by parts is the integral, ah, very nice, <laughs> from t1 to t2 of epsilon sub i of t and then d dt of partial l over partial q sub i dot and then dt. Okay, now I hope you remember that we had to have that epsilon sub i of t1 equals 0, and epsilon sub i of t2 equals 0. So this term right here is just 0 minus 0, and it goes away.
Excellent. Now we can combine um, our sum. Okay, so this all equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of the integral from t1 to t2 of epsilon sub i of t times partial L partial Q sub I minus D DT partial L partial Q sub I dot DT. And now this whole thing has to be equal to zero for any epsilon, for any choices of the n functions epsilon sub i of t, as long as epsilon sub i of t1 and epsilon sub i of t2 are zero. Um, so what does that mean? Well, let's use a bit of logic here. Um, and it's not hard to guess what it is. But let's just call this whole thing, I'm just going to call it um, something. So, if there were, and notice that something um, has like, there are n somethings, right? So I should really, because there is an i right here, so I should really call it something sub i. So if there were some i and some t, because really this is also, really this is really a function of t, right? Even though we didn't really write it like that. So if there is some i and some t such that something sub i, um, I guess I'll write it like this, you know, because it's just to show it's the same thing as this, such that something sub i was not equal to zero, then we could choose um, our epsilon sub i's such that the whole sum, ooh, that's not how you spell whole, such that the whole sum wasn't zero. So how do I show that? Well, say it would be really easy. We would just say, okay, um, here's a graph, um, here's t sub 1, here's t sub 2, and right here is the specific t, that's the sum t at which our specific something sub i isn't equal to zero. So all we have to do is choose our epsilon sub i of t to just be a little bump on this, the bump up just a little bit at that particular t, and then have all the other epsilons just be equal to zero, all the ones that weren't equal to this i, right? So therefore, because um, we're able, so <laughs> therefore, there, so by contradiction, there can't be any i and any t such that this thing in parentheses is ever not equal to zero. So therefore, or I guess I should say, um, therefore, all of our something sub i's are all equal to zero. And now I can finish my logic. Okay, uh, this is kind of like um, when the teacher leaves writing on the, on the uh, dry erase board or on the chalkboard and you want them to erase it. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to write it like this. Therefore, partial L over partial Q sub I minus d dt partial l 
over partial q sub i dot is equal to zero for all i equals one through n. And this right here is the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, so we have now found the Oof. So after all that work, we've now found the conditions such that delta s equals zero, such that a path is stationary in complete generality. And that's really the hard, that's really like the main thing that I wanted to show you so far. And now I'm going to talk about why this is even important at all. Or actually, um, before I tell you why it's important, let me just give you an example of um, how it works using our example of the one particle in one dimension. So all we're worrying about is the position of the particle x and its velocity x dot. So, you know, partial L partial x is negative phi prime of x and partial L partial x dot is equal to m x dot. And then our Euler-Lagrange equation, as we wrote it before, was d dt partial l partial, well, I said q sub i, but now the only q I have is x. So x dot plus partial l partial x equals 0. So that would just be negative d dt um, m x dot minus v prime of x equals zero. And then that is just equal negative m x dot dot or negative m x double dot minus v prime of x equals zero. And that's just m x double dot equals negative v prime of x, which, which is our same old f equals ma as before. So it's the same exact thing as we derived last time. Now the final thing I want to talk about um, is why is this important, right? If the uh, least principle of least action and all that stuff is the same exact way as doing it, you know, with f equals ma and all that stuff, then why don't we, why do we even care? Like, why don't we just use that? Well, I mean, for one, it's cool, but there are some real benefits to looking at things this way. So we, we just found the Euler-Lagrange equation, right? And that is a way of taking a Lagrangian L, right, and getting our equations of motion. And by equations of motion, I mean a differential equation saying how all of our particles um, evolve in time, right? So the Euler-Lagrange equation, which I will write out, I guess I'll write it out again, is just a differential equation. It's just, if you actually unpack it, is just a differential equation, or I guess a set of differential equations, a set of n-differential equations. So because our Lagrangian L only depends on q sub i and q sub i dot, right? This, the Euler-Lagrange equation, is a set of first, or sorry, second order, second order differential equations. Why is it second order? Well, by second order, I mean that it only contains stuff like q sub i, q sub i dot, and q sub i double dot. And the double dot means that this is a second order differential equation because it only depends up to two time derivatives. And why is that? Well, this only has q and q dots in it. Um, and that's because L has q and q dots in it. Um, but then this, which also only has q and q dots in it, gets differentiated by time. So this thing has q, q dots, and q double dots in it. So altogether, this whole equation has q, q dots, 
and q double dots in it. So okay, well, that's just a name. That's just us calling it a second-order differential equation. But the point is that um, in a second-order differential equation, if we have some initial conditions of where all, all our particles start and what all their original velocities are, right? So if we know all like you know the q sub i's and q sub i dots, right? Then we can use each equation of motion. So if we know all q sub i's and q sub i dots, we can solve for all q sub i double dots. And then one could imagine taking a computer and saying, okay, well, you know, all of our particles start with some positions and some velocities, right? And take a little time step forward, and then you find the acceleration of the velocity, right? And that's your new velocity. And then move the particles there after a little bit of time. And then they have some new velocity, and then you find the new acceleration. And then, you know, you could sweep out all the trajectories that all your different particles take, right? So it gives us, so it gives us, so Euler-Lagrange equation gives us a full description of our system, right? Our full equations of motion, full description of system, as long as we know the Lagrangian, as long as we know L, right? And the thing is that it's easy, usually, to find L because L is just equal to the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Um, and it's usually pretty easy to find the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So there are a lot of problems, for example, when um, it's a lot easier to just say, all right, wait, what's my kinetic energy and what's my potential energy than it is to um, do it the F equals MA way of doing things. So a famous example of a problem like this is you have two pendulums. Oh. Let me draw this. Yeah. You have two pendulums that are connected at a hinge. And they have two lengths. So this pendulum has length L1. This pendulum has length L2. This ball right here, this weight has weight M1, N sub 1. This one has weight M sub 2. And this whole thing is described by two angles, theta sub 1 and theta sub 2. And now, I really, it'd be kind of interesting to do, but I, I don't even know how you could do it. Try, try doing this whole thing. Try figuring out what happens here. The F equals MA, MA way of doing things. It's actually like, very complicated because you have all these, um, you know, force, you have, you know, the centrifugal forces. I mean, okay, that's not a real force, but you know what I mean. You have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, yeah, you have tension in the rods. Um, of the pendulums. There are all these different forces, but it's so easy to just write the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, right? And then once you have that, well, then your two Q sub i's would be theta 1, theta 1, and theta 2. Those are your two only variables. And then you just use the Euler-Lagrange equation, you find your two um, equations of motion, and then you're done. Um, there are a lot of other examples of problems, like, for example, you could have a ceiling with like a spring, and then there's a pendulum on the spring, right? And that makes an angle with the vertical. Well, I drew it a bit tilted, but, you know. Um, or there are lots of problems like, you know, let's say, hmm, let's say you have like a rod, and then there's a hoop attached to the rod, and the rod is free to rotate. And then on the hoop, there's a bead, and the bead you know, has some angle on the hoop. So the hoop can spin and the bead can spin. Um, it's really easy to write the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And 
I guess what I'm really trying to say is that this is really good for dealing with constraints. Um, and I guess I haven't talked too much about constraints yet. Um, but everything I've just, let me just say that everything I've just said works for constraints, right? Like this bead is constrained to the hoop. And this hoop is constrained to spin in this way. Um, another reason why it's just sort of good to know about this sort of thing is that we can just summarize our system in just one equation. And that's just L equals something. So when, I, when the moment we say L equals whatever L is, we're totally done. We don't have to write out all N equations, um, equations of motion. We can just say L equals this, and then everyone looking at me, oh yeah, yeah, L equals that. And you don't have to do all this, con this complex explanation of whatever your system is. Um, and I guess one other way, one other thing is that when you think in terms of Lagrangians and stuff, you can look at the symmetries of your system, which I'm going to make a video about um, soon, but you have no Noether's theorem. And that's pretty cool. I'm just going to say, like, ooh, that's really cool. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to looking at, to doing things this way, things. Um, to looking at, <laughs> to looking at, <laughs> it's been a long video, at looking at things this way. And I guess I ought to just say, that um, this way of looking at things is often called Lagrangian mechanics. So if you've successfully watched this video, you can say that you know what Lagrangian mechanics is. So uh, yeah, I hope you learned uh, something good. And I hope you uh, look up what Noether's theorem is, because that's pretty cool too.